Well, I didn't know for a long time why I did that in the first year of WWF's existence. But then I set up a company with several other people in 1978 called Environmental Data Services. And one of the co-founders was one of the co-founders of WWF. He asked me that same question. I told him I just didn't know where it came from. I stood up in front of 80 boys, asked for their what we'd call pocket money uh, for two weeks and got it. Um, and he said he did know why I'd done it. And I said, how could he possibly? And it turned out that they'd managed to get a, the front cover and eight pages inside one of our major national newspapers. And as soon as he said that, I could remember going into the school library, seeing the newspaper, reading it, and thinking I'd have to do uh, something about it. Um, I've been in the environmental movement pretty much ever since. Uh, I continue to work with uh, WWF and many other organizations. Um, but that's where it's, that, that's sort of where it started. Well, back in the 1970s, when I first started approaching companies uh, around the world, but particularly in Europe, uh, they really didn't want to talk to people from the outside, particularly people interested in environmental and social issues. Uh, now we'd say uh, the sustainable development um, agenda. And it took us about nine months to a year to get the first company to want to uh, talk. And then very quickly, within 18 months, uh, we were being asked to um, help major companies write their first environmental policy statement. So this thing happened um, relatively quickly, but it's, it, it's, it actually has taken quite a long time. Uh, but nowadays, uh, and this has probably been true for 10 to 15 years, if you don't get through to director level, board level people very quickly, you really wonder what's uh, going on. So in that sense, the agenda has gone mainstream in a way that we really struggled uh, to make happen 30, 40 years ago. I think what countries do and what companies do are, are intimately interlinked and the measurements of success are also uh, intimately interlinked. And even the creator of the uh, gross domestic and gross national product uh, formulation warned that it was actually a pretty poor measure if you if you really wanted to uh, address uh, proper system health. So I think we got to the point where that is both very clear to a growing number of people and where a, a growing number of innovators are trying to come up with uh, different um, approaches. I, I, I think there's a limit to how far individual companies can drive that, although they can support uh, useful activity. My co-author on a previous book, uh, Jochen Zeitz, uh, was at the time chairman and CEO of Puma, the German sportswear brand, and they came up with the environmental profit and loss methodology. For them, that was one third of the triple bottom line uh, methodology. So co companies can do uh, good work, but ultimately I think this is for economists uh, to address. Um, uh, if. Uh, we're really going to get our brains around this in an effective way. And with Kate Rayworth, with Mariana Mazzucato, with people like that, you're beginning to see some really interesting uh, economists stepping up to the mark. But there's a lot of work still to be done. The original idea behind the triple bottom line, which I came up with in 1994, was that at the time, groups like what was then called the Business Council for Sustainable Development mm -hmm. talk about eco-efficiency, which was great for engineers. It was about how do you make or save money by saving energy or by uh, cleaning up uh, pollution. And nothing wrong with that, but I basically was saying, uh, in addition, wouldn't it be uh, better if we thought about not just the financial uh, performance of the company, but the economic impact, the social impact, and the environmental impact. That was the triple bottom line. That was 1994. Uh, 1995, I came up with the popularization, people, planet, profit. And both of those concepts have sort of gone into the language. So you now have platforms like the Global Reporting Initiative, doing triple bottom line or sustainability reporting, you have B corporations, thousands of them around the world, now formally chartered around the triple bottom line. You may or may not be aware, uh, but in, uh, June of last year, I formally did a product recall 
of the Triple Bottom Line through the Harvard Business Review. HBR said this is the first time any inventor of a management concept had ever recalled it or tried to. And the reason I did that was because I thought that people, the original idea of the Triple Bottom Line was it was about system change. Uh, basically, the argument was capitalism, markets, business, um, fine as far as they went, but they didn't remotely go far enough. And if we really wanted to protect the environment and um, uh, support society in the way that it needed to be supported, then we really had to rethink in a quite fundamental way. What happened afterwards was people started to think about the triple bottom line as a balancing act. How, how do we balance off economic, mainly financial, social and environmental uh, factors? Um, and I think where it's going now, and I'm about to reintroduce the triple bottom line, but I'm saying in addition to those economic, social and environmental dimensions, think about it this way. There are three other cross-cutting dimensions. One is responsibility, and that's where most people in business have chosen to see the triple bottom line operating. But in addition, there's resilience. So whether you're talking about supply chain or cities, in a, a world where climate change in particular, water scarcity, these sorts of issues are pressing in. Resilience becomes increasingly urgent. And then thirdly, uh, regeneration. It's not good enough to just reduce uh, the bad impacts that we produce on the world. We're going to have to start reversing those. And regeneration across the triple bottom line, again, how do we regenerate our economies? How do we regenerate our societies and communities? And most critically of all, how do we begin to the extraordinary intergenerational task of regenerating the natural environment? That I think is the challenge that we now confront. I think agriculture and food would be very high on my list. Most people would say the energy transportation uh, complex, and that's immensely important. And renewable energy, absolutely uh, critical. But I'd say agriculture and food, and for various different reasons. One is that we've really got to slow and then reverse the land take of involved in agricultural production. If you look at diets around the world, there's absolutely no question that uh, meat-based diets are a very critical part of uh, our problem. I say that having been a vegetarian for 40 years. Um, I don't want to sound missionary, but I do think we've got to radically both reduce the amount of meat coming from livestock, and I think that's about to happen over the next 10 to 15 years for a bunch of other factors. But at the same time, we've got to work out how to produce for those people who do still eat meat or fish, uh, we've got to work out how to do that uh, synthetically to create uh, meat and chicken and fish type products from cells. If I had to pick three, I'd go for agriculture and food, I'd go for the energy and transportation uh, compact, and I would go for finance, uh, the world of investment and funding. The uh, financial markets are in effect the, um, the heart and the circulatory system of capitalist uh, societies and it's, it's even more significant than that. It's not, it's not simply the equivalent of blood and nutrients going around, it's, it, it's a complete mental uh, paradigm or mindset that goes with it and we, for 60 year, plus years now we've had the Milton Friedman concept that uh, really we've got to get government out of all of this and the only real responsibility of business is to make a profit. Now he had some nuances uh, to that which people have uh, uh, chosen to uh, forget uh, over time and I think over time that's become very pernicious and I think the financial markets although they do a great job in what they uh, elect to focus on uh, they're focusing far too narrowly in terms of um, the, again, back to the triple bottom line. I mean, they're focusing on the financial returns, not the broader economic consequences, impacts, uh, positive and negative, let alone the social and environmental consequences. And increasingly, we hear a discussion of the environmental, social and governance aspects of uh, investment um, and I think that's a very very healthy uh, 
uh, trend, a very welcome trend, and it's very interesting. That's spreading quite strongly now into Asia, into places like Japan, into China, uh, uh, India, and so on. So. Uh, I think the um, financial markets are waking up, but by God, they've got a long way yet to go. I think there are a number of industries whose uh, malign or negative effect has been somewhat overlooked. I mean, if you take an example like tobacco, it's very clear now that people are more aware of the health effects than they once would have been and the introduction of vaping technologies and so on is giving people a sense that there may be safer ways of, of consuming those sorts of uh, drugs if people continue to do that. But I think tobacco has been an obvious killer for quite uh, a long time. Food uh, and modern diets have become a very significant killer alongside urbanization. One of the things that cities do, I, I, I was trained as a city planner. I love cities. I think they are, in some ways, potentially our saviors. But at the same time, they are um, chronic disease generators. So people who move from rural areas into cities tend to uh, become obese at higher rates than they would have done in their rural uh, existences. They tend to develop linked to obesity, a range of chronic diseases, and particularly uh, diabetes. So if, when you talk about silent uh, killers, I think modern diets uh, would be in there uh, as well. Now, the plastics industry is another. Now, that's not so much killing uh, people as it is basically killing the world ocean, um, the seas and the oceans uh, of this planet of ours. And that's only relatively recently uh, being thrust into ordinary people's uh, consciousnesses. Uh, but you're starting to hear about um, ha questions like how do we take the um, plastics industry into a circular economy that is one hell of a jump from where we are uh, currently but um, somebody once said if you if you live in a time without major challenges you've somehow been robbed well we haven't been robbed we've got we've got the most mega challenges that any generation has had for quite some uh, time possibly even including those who went through uh, world wars Well, I think we're in a very peculiar position at the moment, both as a species and as individuals. Um, we're going through what I s describe as a, a historic U-bend. Every so often, a system that people have grown up in starts to unravel, come apart. Now, people talk about globalization for the last 25, uh, 30 years. We're going into a period of deglobalization. They've talked about democracy. We're going into a period of uh, populism. Uh, they talk about, they, they assume uh, stable uh, natural systems, climate and so on. Uh, increasingly we're going to see uh, the destabilization of many of these systems. So I think we're going into a U-bahn uh, and some people assume that that's just going to go permanently downwards. I don't. I think that these um, U-bahns tend to clear after about 12 to 15 years. So that's quite a long time. But already, all around, you see a new order, a new economy uh, starting to sort of struggle to its feet. And I think our challenge now is to identify some of the innovators, the pioneers, the entrepreneurs, the investors, the policy makers who are making that uh, new order uh, evolve and support them as best as we uh, can. Mm -hmm.